Welcome today, this is Jim Satterfield. We're going to be talking about behavioral risk threat assessment. How do you stop bullying, suicide, and guns before it's too late? This is the second in the 2017 webinar series with the Eastern Great Lakes Association of Contingency Professionals and the Greater Rochester Chamber of Commerce. And we'll talk about those in just a few minutes. Additionally, uh, we'd like you to be our friends on Twitter. It's at uh, Firestorm Soul. On Facebook, it's Firestorm Solutions. There is a hashtag for this section, and that hashtag is hashtag crisis coach. Uh, Firestorm transforms crisis into value. Firestorm empowers you to manage risk and crises. Our expertise is crisis management, critical decision support, crisis communications, crisis public relations, and consequence management. Uh, Firestorm is America's crisis coach, and we're really balancing that uh, crisis and risk equation. So there's a disclaimer for today's webinar, as there is every time we do one, and it's not complete without the oral comments. Uh, any work product provided for us should be used in conjunction with your legal county uh, counsel to make sure that it's compatible with your company and direction. Moreover, it should not be interpreted as legal advice or legal opinion. Don't you love attorneys who can tell you what you need to say it every day? The uh, webinar series is underwritten by the Greater Rochester Chamber of Commerce and the Eastern Great Lakes Association of Contingency Planners. And you can go to the firestorm.com website and listen to previous uh, webinars in this series. There's a library going back for the last several years. And, and you can register for future webinars and download the briefs or papers associated with this. Uh, the Association of Contingency Professionals, and today uh, we have Lynn uh, Daly with us. And Lynn, you want to talk a little bit about the Great Lakes chapter and what's going on? Sure. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the Eastern Great Lakes chapter of ACP um, includes professional representatives from uh, central and western New York, and we also have folks from parts of Ohio. Uh, it's open to anyone in upstate New York who is engaged in uh, business related to information or cybersecurity, business continuity, disaster recovery, and even emergency management, which is actually my specialty. Um, the membership includes folks not only from uh, public organizations, but also governmental, and I'm, I'm with uh, Rochester Institute of Technology, so we have higher ed folks as part of the group, too. It's very active. Uh, it's a wonderful group. I would suggest it for anyone who's interested in the, in the field. For more information, you can go to our website. Um, easterngreatlakes.acp-international.com. I'm sure that'll come up again. Our chapter president is Michael Redmond. Her telephone number is 917-882-5453. So if you have um, any questions or would like to join, she'd be uh, more than willing to uh, talk to you about it. And thanks for attending this morning. And Lynn's vice president of the chapter, and you can see there are a lot of talented people and knowledgeable uh, and it's a good chance to network if you are looking at a particular problem and want to see what others are doing close by. It's a good chance to have that resource available to you. We're excited about the relationship that we've had, and we look forward to uh, continuing it through the coming years. Uh, I'm Jim Satterfield. I'm the president and CEO of uh, Firestorm, and I look forward to talking with you a little bit today. As we get started, uh, when we see the word crisis, I would ask you to think about what comes to mind. And you see a lot of pictures up there, and I think natural disasters or terrorism comes into play. By the way, those palm trees in the pictures were not shot in the Greater Rochester area, uh, I'd like to point out. But workplace violence seems to be moving forward as an increasing concern. Uh, as we see those elements coming into play with over 2 million episodes annually, uh, in the workplace here in the United States. And a crisis is really a turning point. JFK, uh, in his book, uh, wrote crisis being the blending of two Chinese symbols, one for danger, one for opportunity. And I think that's what we've got to look at as we're, we're going forward to make our plans in place. Now, if we think about our company, and one of those dots represents your company, uh, I'm sure everybody can pick out their appropriate dot. But imagine if something were to happen. What that's going to mean is suddenly your company is going to stand out, your organization 
is going to stand out, just like the red dot that appeared on the screen. And that's the whole reason to have the plans, the training, the exercising and testing so that you can be ready in those moments because our ultimate goal is that we kind of blend in and be business as usual to deal with our normal workplace areas. But when we think about workplace violence, that's something that can come forward and really dominate the landscape within your organization and overpower everything else that you're doing. And the key here is we have a lot of concerns about active shooter and uh, as violence comes into the workplace is what can we do to prevent or recognize those uh, potentials that, that are on the way to violence, to find those individuals before it explodes and before it comes to this type of a violence point. And that's what we're going to talk about today and give you some tools and some direction to help. So where do you start? I think the key element here is that a crisis isn't business as usual, it's business as unusual. Most of the information that you find out initially is wrong, and in the crisis you're going to be forced to make decisions based upon wrong or incomplete information. So that's why a structure, that's why a plan comes into play and it'll make such a big difference. And what we're going to share with you are the lessons that we've learned over the last 12 years of responding and being on site and dealing with these events and identifying them even before they could occur in multiple organizations. So let's jump right on into it. Now, some threatening behavior is very clear. If you look at the bullseye over on the right, you can see that there's a target there, uh, and un you can identify what's happening. And bullying, the fights, uh, weapons at work, those are all pretty clear things. Uh, any type of a threat would come into play. But some of the behaviors aren't so clear. And that's where we need to have the training and awareness to be able to understand uh, the loner personality, the odd behavior, substance abuse. All of those elements come together. And we need to have a program in place to be able to identify them and intercede before they escalate the violence. I would bring to your attention the word in the right-hand column in red, change because that's one of the key triggers that we want to think about. Somebody that normally has been easy to work with you know, becomes argumentative. Someone who has good attendance suddenly has bad attendance. Uh, someone who started to be a member of the team and it's now become a loner. That change factor is one of the things that we look for that would certainly make a difference. And we're focusing here on behavior, not demographics. So, Protective factors, you see them listed here, and those are the things that can mitigate some of the behaviors that we described. We're going to take these two slides and show them to you in a variety of different ways to help frame that so you can get a handle around how do we identify these behaviors before they escalate to violence. So what leads to violence? You'll see from the disks that are up, breakdown in support systems, personal factors, and finally workforce. Uh, workplace factors. And with the descriptors here, it'll give you an idea of what to start thinking about in each one of these. Clearly, if we're thinking of substance abuse, if uh, there's a divorce in the family or financial difficulties, um, if they feel that they've been wronged or there's some injustice at work, these can be the well, uh, the beginning points that would start us down that path that's going to escalate into violence. So who might pose a threat? What's the highest risk? And if you look at the things that are listed here, you can probably put a face on some of these and think about people that you've known in your work career, someone that had some of those concerns or thoughts and where they would come into play. And if you start adding multiples of these, then it's going to push you even closer to uh, a violence area. Uh, there was a webinar last week that we had done with a, an insurance company and they put it out to their 150,000 insureds and we got a phone call immediately saying I've got a person and they have every one of these things. What do I do and where does it come? And that key recognition factor is something that I want you to think about. So let's drill down a little bit more. What are some of the behaviors of concern that are really clear? Any comment about suicide, it's never a joke. We have to take that seriously, and though without intervention, there could be a significant problem. 
by the way, in an education environment, we're finding virtually 100% correlation with someone who is contemplating suicide in a kill list. The student wants to get even, and they're going to take these people out before they commit suicide. We don't have a 100% correlation in the workplace there, but we find that it's an extremely high percentage. So we have to assume that any quote about suicide is extremely important to focus on. Intimidating comments about hurting someone else, uh, attacking them, and going through. I apologize for the rings. Those are coming through on my cell phone. And I uh, thought I had all those turned off. Uh, bits of rage, uh, somebody that's normally easy going and now has become um, seemingly uh, beyond control to be able to deal with and then destroying property. Uh, is somebody putting their fist to the wall or throwing their coffee cup at the wall? Those types of aspects suddenly say this person's on a path that we can recognize and understand. What are the ones that are not so clear? Fascination with weapons. It could be hunting season and looking. That's, a, that's an acceptable area or something you would know. But someone who's fascinated by past crimes, we see each year on the anniversaries of events like Columbine or the Orlando shootings that there will be copycats and others that come out. Depression. Depression is a key indicator where someone feels they don't have any choice. They feel themselves back into a corner. Substance abuse and alcohol, expected abuse at home. We've now seen that domestic violence has come to work. That's a, a growing concern across the country. The number two cause of death of women in the workplace is domestic violence. So it's workplace violence, and that's because domestic violence has come into that workplace area. Uh, hang on, Bill. Okay, let me continue on. So as we look at each of those areas, the warning signs uh, continue with major changes in behavior. That's that delta that we talked about. The rate of change is a concern for you to focus in on. The protective factors, and we listed them earlier, but I wanted to spell them out here. And the more of these that are there, then the less the likelihood that we're going to be in up with that police call to deal with violence in the workplace. The personal attachments, the interests either outside of work or school, the respects authority, the people that have positive coping skills, they take responsibility in, uh, for their actions in coming into play. But as we think about that, how do we structure these things into a comprehensive program? Well, when we think about workplace violence prevention, uh, we start with behavioral risk threat assessment. Uh, the acronym that we use for that is BRFA, Behavioral Risk Threat Assessment. And in that program, there are key components, and there are four elements associated with it. And what we've been talking about is the, is the large part of the first, and that's awareness training training people what to look for, to see those things, to recognize them so you can take action before it escalates to violence. Next into the intelligence network, there are, you have to have that information coming through. Now, it's a combination of multiple things. Number one is anonymous reporting. Many of you have ethics lines or anonymous reporting abilities within your organization. We've seen a shift in the workforce as we move to younger workers that it needs to be on the cell phone with text messaging. If you don't have anonymous text reporting, you're missing a vast source of information that could be coming to you. The standard reporting methods are when that comes through, do you tell your supervisor, do you tell HR? Multiple channels to be able to route that information. Pre-screening and background checks, we all do those before we hire. Many organizations only do uh, the federal uh, criminal uh, database associated with those that have been uh, convicted of felonies. But if someone was arrested for a felony and plea bargained it down to a misdemeanor, they wouldn't be seen in the national database. They would only be seen in your county database. So for most of the companies that you use to do that, there's another opportunity to increase your ability to find that individual that's a problem. Now, in the academic world, in the K-12 and college marketplace, the standard practice is annual background checks. 
as you can within your company, that's another good opportunity. Because if you saw you had an employee who was being arrested for DUIs or domestic violence, it would be a great indicator. And the last key metrics, um, what's changed with this employee? Has the attendance rate gone down? Has they, have they become argumentative in the meetings? Are there things that you can measure that they're, they don't do quite as good a job as they did before? All of that comes together to create your intelligence network. Central repository, what we find is a gap. Uh, organizations where a supervisor sees it but it doesn't get to HR or someone else observes it and it doesn't get communicated back in, that's a, a plan that's designed to fail. And so you have to have a simple repository that all of that information comes into play and is reviewed by your teams, either behavioral management team or your threat management team. Uh, and we'll show you how that structure comes together in a few minutes because then you can categorize that behavior if you're getting all of the data from multiple points. And then lastly, the actual birth and plan. What happens when the tip or the report comes in? How do you categorize it? How do you review it and then do the proper risk screening? What's your action plan? How do you monitor that person's behavior, sign off, and record keeping? One of the things that we want to underscore here is that it's absolutely essential that you do the same thing the same way every time. Because many times we'll find after these events where someone knew and thought, well, that's really not a big deal. And it didn't get communicated, and that was the individual who was on a path to violence. Now, let's kind of return to the behavioral things, frame those, and then we'll give you a system to put, link it all together. So we look at a behavioral snapshot. Let's look at this individual. And we'll look at those categories that you see in the inner part uh, that all touch that particular person with the protective factors around the outside. So first, let's look at social and peer behavior. Do they hold a grudge? Is there withdrawal? Is there name calling, abusive language, history of poor response to limit setting rules? So as you see those types of behaviors, that's going to be one of those indicators that this person is on a path to violence. And as we think about this, this is not a photograph. It's not snapshot one time. It's more of a video looking at their performance over time and what occurs in each of those areas. In the family, is there suspected domestic abuse? Is there some change? Has there been multiple losses, the death of a spouse or a child? Uh, has there been a financial failure within the family? Uh, physiological, and you see the types of paper, uh, behaviors described here. And again, one of the things that helps in many cases is think about your work career and put a face on some of these descriptors to help you better understand. The urgent, uh, these are things that we're not going to be thinking about. We're going to be calling 911. We're going to be doing a direct intervention immediately at that point in time. And then finally, the behaviors. Uh, you see them listed here. Any series of these could be key indicators to you that this person is on a path to violence. These are behaviors of concern. Now, it's important to understand each of these elements in coming together and the, how they interface then with the protective factors. We listed them earlier, and if you're then making a decision. So initially, we do the, ca the categorization. I'll show you how that works in just a moment. And then that will lead to the next steps that we would do with the individual. Now, the, Behavioral Risk Threat Assessment Program has all of those elements that we had showed you earlier, but here they are in kind of a graphic pulling them together. Over on the left of your screen, you'll see the awareness. That's training your employees, your staff, to be able to understand what's going on in each of those areas, and then picking that information up, whether it's through the intelligence network with anonymous reporting, talking to the HR, your supervisor, uh, screening, all of those elements we discussed. Once that comes in, then there has to be a system or a protocol or a procedure to bring that information in and make those appropriate decisions. I'll take that tip report intake and initial, initial risk categorization in just a moment and explain that in a little bit more detail. The central repository is shown next. The threat management team or the behavioral management team then does the investigation 
and does the formal risk uh, screening, and that's something that is trainable, and you can have your people be able to do that. And then what are we going to do with this person? What's our action plan? How are we going to monitor it? And sometimes we refer to this as case management, and then the record keeping and so on. The green box down below lists the other things that we want to make sure that we have in place. And so as Lynn was talking earlier in our webinar about the emergency side, we do need emergency response plans and protocols. The person standing in the door with a gun, we, what is it that we need to do? When we think about behavioral risk threat assessment, we're trying to intervene before we get to that point. Now let's take that categorization and start to understand it. Uh, you've seen something that's come in. There's a person responsible within your organization to do a high level uh, categorization of those actions. In school, we would call that an administrator on duty. In your case, maybe it's your HR or your security will make that decision. And we want to put this into one of three buckets. Is it routine? Is it the normal discipline problem? We're going to deal with that as we always have within our company. Let's go over to the right with that red box where it says uh, action is urgent. Here, we've got a real threat. We're calling 911. We're going to take immediate action. We're going to uh, be dealing with that individual and handle everything that needs to be done. The areas where most organizations run into extreme difficulty is that center. They've now got to investigate it. It's not a normal routine kind of an area. It's not all the way to call 911. How bad is it? What do we need to do? And that's where the threat management team comes in, and there's a protocol that they go through. Now, you'll notice in the box at the top of the screen it says to complete the initial risk categorization form and determine the action required. There are steps and procedures that lead you through it by asking a series of questions, and then that way it will help you determine what's happening. Regardless of which one of those three categories that you're in, all of that information goes into the central repository because it may not have been a problem this time, but it might be next time, and linking these two patterns together will be a significant help. Now, the actual screening, that we were in that area where we have to do an investigation, what are the determinations, and there are four that we can come with here when we do the screening? One is it's a guarded risk. You know, it's more than kind of a normal discipline thing. We just need to watch it, and we want to have some supervision, and we're going to do ongoing monitoring. Let's go all the way to the right again to that imminent risk. Wait a minute. We start investigating. We find that this person is really at the point where they are taking an action. We need to intervene. All the same things that we would have done before, getting security involved, calling the police, we would deal with that because we can well discover that as we're screening. To the left of that, it says severe risk. Here's someone that we've looked at, and based upon our process and going through, filling out the forms, doing the uh, assessments that need to take place, we've determined that they uh, need to have an intervention associated with it. And we would probably suspend this employee, uh, direct them to a psychologist or a psychiatrist to have a statement that they're not a risk to themselves or others, and uh, to return before they can return to the workforce. When they come back to the workforce at this point in time, we would then have a reentry plan, we'd have a meeting with them, we'd have a very detailed follow-up and coordination level associated with it. And then that middle box, again, is an elevated risk. It's more than just a guarded, it's not all the way up to severe. We're going to allow them to remain in the workplace, but they'll have a specific program that we're going to be doing with them. It'll be monitored closely, and we'll be able to make those determinations. There are tools and resources and checklists on how you go through this process. Uh, success stories. Uh, we have a manufacturing client that uh, has identified an employee. They hire a lot of vets. And some have post-traumatic stress, and they were on the, the work floor and the, and the plant, and the employee was saying, you know, I could put a, one employee up over here with a gun and another one over there, and we'll have a field of fire. We can command and control the work floor. The supervisor immediately identified this behavior, and there was an 
the, the birth of process would be kicked into gear. And the discussions went on, and the employee later thanked the company for helping them. They were on a path that would have led to uh, a negative outcome, and their intervention made a difference in that employee's life. We see this on many occasions where this type of an area can identify that potential before the path to violence comes together. So to summarize everything we've said to this point, the Behavioral Risk Threat Assessment is a workplace violence prevention program. Now that's different than an emergency response program. How do we respond when the person is standing there with a gun? Do you need that? Yes, but the likelihood that you're having an active shooter is very low. The likelihood that you could have an employee that has these behaviors and has started that path is extremely high, and that's the reason. Awareness first, train everyone on the warning signs that we talked about this morning. Establish the uh, anonymous reporting, both in email or on an application, uh, off of your website, or in a text, or a phone call. All of those abilities to get that information in. Make sure that information is not lost, that it's kept in a central repository, and that it's reviewed by your threat management team on a regular basis to see if there's been a change. And then the plan is you do the investigation, you do the screening, the action plan for the person that's involved. Sometimes we refer to that as case management, and then the ongoing monitoring, and ultimately sign up. Where the team is put together to do the threat management, the recommendation is that that's three people. Someone from HR to talk about the human element within your organization someone from security or safety or facility that knows the property and how it's set up in the construction. And the last is someone from your operational side of the house. We never want to go below a three people group making these decisions. You don't need six, you don't need 10, but you need to have a pool that there are at least three people. Where we've seen difficulties where it comes down to one person's decision and they say they're not a threat, and it later turns out that they were wrong. We find that three people working together with all of the tools that we've been talking about will reach a decision that has a high likelihood of a positive outcome. So we started talking about a variety of these things, and coming back to this question, can you really predict a crisis? And the answer is yes, you can. If you look at the warning signs, if they were unheeded, then you're much more likely to have that type of an event occur in any area. So as we take the warning signs and we look at the indicators, these are all pre-crisis indicators. They were that pattern that you can see if you're looking for it and understanding it in a systematic approach. How many times after an event have you seen someone come forward and say, you know, that thing wasn't right there. I, recognize that there was a problem that, that was occurring. This gives you that opportunity to intervene and to handle it in advance. So when we think about predictive intelligence, and by the way, the term of art here is open source intelligence. Uh, and there's some statistics that work effectively here, and I'll kind of emphasize those on this in the next slide uh, as we go forward. If someone has ill intent, someone else knows. That's been, that linkage is about 80% of the time. And 67% of the time, two or more people know, and when they know, what do they do? They talk, and what do they talk? They talk on social media. Now, we're not talking about packing into somebody's account and uh, this password protected. We're talking about looking at information that's in the public domain. If I went to your building and took a can of spray paint and wrote on the outside of it, anyone who was driving down the street would see that, and that would give them an indication of what was going on. So when we think about social media, just like that can of spray paint on the side of the building, it's not random. It's targeted. It's being said or done for a reason. And with the millions and millions of postings that are done daily, they're done for a reason, and there's a particular target. You want to identify who is the target of that because it will certainly help you in your decisions that you're making. And the concept, again, is when people know, they talk, 
and they talk on social media. Words matter, intent matters. If you know, if I'm so mad at that guy, I can kill him. It's not just a casual conversation. Uh, and the more specific the threat, the, the higher the risk factor and the greater the urgency to intervene. And by the way, this is now a whole new career for English majors. For those of you who went to school and got that degree in English, where you looked at the semantics of the speech, the syntax, the concept, context, and the idiom as we look through each of those areas. So when we think about it, we're going to talk about listening and looking. But you've got to listen to this pattern of conversation there. Look at it as it occurs and monitor it all the time. And so you have the ability to see the impact because you were looking. Now, we got a call uh, on September on a Wednesday afternoon from a client that has hundreds and hundreds of restaurants around the country. And the chief risk officer said, we had a posting on our Facebook, corporate Facebook account saying that I'm going to, that this person who made the anonymous posting was going to go to a specific restaurant and kill everyone on Friday. And he asked, could we help? And we said, we'll try. So our chief intelligence officer, Karen Mazzullo, started doing research to see what uh, she could identify. And she was first able to figure out the first name of the person. Then she was able to figure out his girlfriend's name. Finally, his last name is and we were able to call client back after the three o'clock phone call before five and share that with the client. We turned it over to the police, who went and had an, inter uh, an interview. It's not a warm fuzzy meeting as that conversation started. And so it was really that within two hours we were able to identify the person who made the threat and had every intention. Turns out it was a 17-year-old boy who'd been fired in the restaurant, and his intent was to go back and quote, even the score. While that was going on, Karen set up a geofence around that specific restaurant to monitor communications in and out, and was able to determine that the store manager was selling drugs out the back door. In two hours, she found the would-be killer and the drug dealer. I'll tune in next week to see what can happen in the show. Because here's the key element, that third flag you don't have until tomorrow. You can't wait until that gun comes to work. We set up a geofence around a distribution center for a very large public company and found an employee who made 80 postings in one eight-hour shift. Makes you wonder how big the job. It starts out they were, didn't, didn't feel like they were liked at work and there were some problems and people wanted them to fail. And he had problems specifically with the supervisor. And it turns out as he continues to talk that he felt they were racial. And the last posting of the day was that there's only one way to solve that, and that's with a gun. I'm going to bring a gun to work tomorrow and solve it once and for all. Would you want to know about that today, or would you want to know about it tomorrow when that employee walks in with a gun? When we talk about open source intelligence, it's also linked to other things that you need to be aware of. If you're a government contractor, there's a new requirement that went into effect on December 31st of 2016, that you have an insider threat program. We can thank Mr. Snowden for that new development that's put into place. But if it's true for a government contractor, it's true for you within your business. So thinking about predictive intelligence, thinking about open source intelligence, what can you do to identify that? Because if we understand the behaviors of concern using predictive intelligence, we can identify those. So the two things that we talked about here under that topic were listening and looking. When we listen, we're looking at streams and phrases and words, and it gives us a general awareness. Once we find a location of concern, an individual of concern, or a, an event, then we can look at it more specifically and look at geocoding as a, as a use, going back in time and seeing what they had done a year ago, two years ago, or actually months ago to see is this escalating or de-escalating within the process. So there are a great many things that we can do before we have to activate that emergency plan when the gun comes to work. So if we think about the recommendations, you need to have a plan. Yes, you need to have emergency plans or an active shooter plan. 
within your organization. But having a behavioral concern plan in that red box there, with understanding the warning signs, having everyone aware of that and involved, having a system to systematically do that threat assessment and render the opinion, is this person on a path to violence makes a difference. There are support services that you can have uh, in that process, if your team was trying to do the assessment and they have questions, uh, we can give you virtual threat and violence support. Or there are local resources in your areas, forensic psychologists, for example. By the way, there are new insurance coverages that relate in this area, and it could be a gap in your existing coverage. So I would check with your insurance broker to say, what are, what are our coverages if, in fact, we have an event here? And open source intelligence. That's an absolute key to build this program uh, in, within your organization. Then you have to train your people, you have to test, and make sure that this process works. So next steps, update your risk and threat assessment. Physical security hasn't gone away. We need to make sure that access is controlled within your location under the plan. Make sure your plans align with best practices, develop a behavioral risk threat assessment program in your organization. Uh, finalize how you're going to communicate at those points as this starts to escalate. You can contact us for support. If you find yourself in a crisis, we'll get on the phone with you 24 by 7 at no cost for the first hour to help you frame what's going on. And that word stop really relates to four things. One, stabilizing the situation. Two, triggering the responses. Opining on the consequences, what's going to come next. And T, preventing you from making the common mistakes. I would strongly encourage you to do an analysis of your insurance and current response plans. We've worked with numerous companies in taking test exercises, turning them over to their uh, insurance broker and saying, how are we covered in these situations? Regularly we find material gaps in that coverage versus the risk and threats that they're exposing. And then finally, stress test your plan. Put your plan in place and saying, if we saw this, what would we do? If this occurred, how would we respond in each of those areas? Um, last week we did a virtual exercise on this topic. We had hundreds of companies putting their teams through and understanding how they would make decisions and relate in each of these areas. This is an area that we would like to share more information with you on. We're going to try to reach out to everyone on today's broadcast and answer questions and there's an opportunity for you to put the behavioral risk threat assessment program to work within your organization. So as we uh, continue on, uh, what's next? We need to download the brief. Downloading the brief is easy. You go to firestorm.com. It'll be up on the website uh, next week, and you can get a briefing on this topic. There will also be a recording there of the webinar if you want to share that with others in your organization. So that's one of the uh, exciting things about your involvement in the chamber or with the uh, Association of Contingency Professionals. You've got these online resources that are available to you regularly. Uh, our thanks go out to the Greater Rochester Chamber of Commerce and the Eastern Great Lakes Association of Contingency Professionals. Uh, I think having local contacts and working locally is a key differentiator in the market. If you would like to get additional resources, you can go to firestorm.com. Uh, you can click on the resource areas there and see future webinars or speaking events or access those that have already been recorded. Uh, you can uh, send us an email at webinars at firestorm.com or you can pick up the phone and call us at 800-321-2219. We live in, in interesting times. That's, uh, I quote that phrase a lot. It's an Irish blessing or an Irish curse, depending upon how you interpret that phrase. But what we've seen is a, an increase in violence across our country, both internally in our companies and in our schools, and finally just on the streets. And as we see this escalation of violence, the key area here is it's a lot easier to intervene when it's a behavior of concern before that gun comes to work. Thank you for taking the time today to kind of stop and take a deep breath and think about what do I know in my organization? What is it that I need to do? How can we intervene to make a difference? 
whether it's that vet with post-traumatic stress or that uh, worker who's having uh, a divorce or a death or uh, financial difficulties, that person who has been bullied or uh, you know, even the abuse factors that can come into play, those are the opportunities to intervene in, not when they feel the hopelessness that there's only one way out. We see, unfortunately, that that gun does come to work. We have seen this make a difference. This program can be done, and it's something that you can lead the charge within your company. Thank you for your time. There will be another webinar next month. We look forward to having this opportunity again uh, to speak with you. Uh, keep warm. If you're in western New York, that's kind of a big deal there. And at least you can look toward the east and New York and New Jersey and Connecticut where they're battling uh, 10 or 12 inches of snow and say, you know, we've got it pretty good here. Have a great day, everyone. Goodbye.